So um, hello, everybody. Again, I'm Monica Kuhnreds. Um, I'm the founder and CEO of the Rett Syndrome Research Trust. And my connection to, um, uh, to Rett Syndrome is I have a 24-year-old daughter that was diagnosed at the age of two. Some of you may be asking, um, what's the connection between Rett Syndrome and MECP2 duplication syndrome? I think all of you know that um, it's the same gene um, that affects our children. In Rett syndrome, there's a mutation which leads to reduced levels of the protein. And in duplication, there um, is two or sometimes three um, genes uh, that cause the symptoms that your children and loved ones have. Um, the Rett syndrome research trust started in 2008. And shortly after that, I was approached by a number of duplication families who asked whether we would be willing to also fund research for duplication and use the infrastructure um, that was already in place, including our, our staff. Um, and we agreed to do that. I, I felt it was the right thing to do. Um, there's a lot of um, overlap between the two disorders in terms of the scientists that we were already speaking with. Um, and so um, the MECP2 duplication syndrome fund started at, Rets and, at um, RSRT and we've been able to fund um, a number of projects, $4 million worth of projects um, in the last um, eight or nine years or so. Um, today, um, we're thrilled to hear about um, the database um, that Daniel Ta and Helen Leonard and Jenny Downs are um, gonna be speaking to us about. Dr. Helen Leonard and Dr. Jenny Downs are co-head of the child disability team at the Telethon Kids Institute in Western Australia. Dr. Leonard has qualifications in medicine and public health and is a, and is a principal research fellow at the Institute and associate professor at the University of Western Australia. Dr. Downs has a clinical background in pediatric physiotherapy and is a principal research fellow at the Institute She's also a lecturer at Curtin University and an adjunct associate professor at the University of Western Australia. Daniel Ta is a PhD candidate at the University of Western Australia. He's studying at the Institute. He's got a background in uh, biomedical science and honors in, in molecular biology. And um, Dr. Leonard, Dr. Downs and Daniel are currently working on better characterizing the MECP2 duplication syndrome. And as part of their natural history study, they've launched the MECP2 duplication database um, to capture health related information and to better understand and improve clinical awareness of the disorder. So that's the introductions. I'm gonna hand it over to Daniel who's gonna take you through his presentation. And then at the end, um, we will have time for uh, questions and answers. Thank you very much. I'm gonna share my screen now. We can see that, Daniel. Sorry, what was that? I'm just confirming that we see it. Oh, perfect, perfect. Uh, thank you very much for joining in everyone. I'm really excited to talk to you all. Um, thank you, Monica, for that lovely introduction. And thank you to the Rett Syndrome Research Trust for organizing and hosting this webinar. My name is Daniel, and I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Western Australia. And this research is being conducted at the Telephone Kids Institute. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Leonard and Dr. Downs, uh, who will be making um, a, a, an appearance at the Q&A session towards the end. And I want to give a special thanks to all the uh, researchers and families that are tuning in today, particularly if uh, you are staying up late to listen to this or if this is preventing you from sleeping in on a Saturday morning. Um, today, um, I'd love to talk to you about the launch of our project, which is the MECP2 Duplication Database or MD Base, which occurred about 11 months ago. So I'd love to give you guys some research progress and updates along the way. The contents of today's webinar will cover who we are as researchers and why it's important that we do epidemiological research. Uh, what are the aims of this project and how we came to develop the international uh, MD base uh, with the participation of families and parents. I'll have the opportunity to cover a little bit about our current understanding of this disorder, which will allow me to present some very preliminary data from our data collection. We'll discuss what's to come in the year uh, that follows this, how you can get involved, and we'll have a Q&A session towards the end. So, um, as Monica um, uh, explained, Dr. Leonard and Dr. Downs and myself were from, the, were from the Telephone Kids Institute. And as you can see from the photos, 
That's our lovely office space. We're actually housed within a children's hospital. We're housed within the Perth Children's Hospital. And so this research is really important to us as part of the child disability team. Dr. Leonard and Dr. Downs has extensive research background experience and understanding of rare childhood disorders, such as Rett syndrome, such as CDL5 deficiency disorder. And they're bringing their expertise into looking at MECP2 duplication syndrome as of recent. What we're really trying to do is to better understand this disorder and hopefully answer some of those gaps in knowledge uh, for parents and for clinicians and researchers alike. So why is it important that we're conducting epidemiological research and understanding the natural history of a disorder? Well, for a rare disorder such as MECP2 duplication syndrome, there is unmet clinical understanding. So what this means is that there's a lack of clinical awareness and what we're trying to do with finding these answers to these questions is to streamline, uh, smoothen out and improve the dialogue that happens between parents and healthcare professionals in the planning of clinical management. Hopefully with our questions, we can also um, improve the quality of life for patients and families by understanding the clinically important domains of this disorder. And all of these uh, answers hopefully will serve to empower families because being left in the dark is a very horrible feeling. And we really are empathetic about that. Having natural history data is also a prerequisite for uh, producing future genetic treatment. The FDA Office of Orphan Products Development states that in order to advance the development of orphan products such as drugs, biologics, uh, devices, and medical foods that aid in the diagnosis and treatment of rare childhood disorders, we need to have natural history data. So it's really important that we're partaking in this research that we can help to aid in the development of therapeutics moving forward. So what are the research aims of our project? In 2019, we came together as a group and we identified that there was a lack of clinical understanding in this rare childhood disorder. And so we identified some very broad umbrella uh, aims to target. One of them, which is to better characterize MECP2 duplication syndrome. And we can do this by examining the prevalence and onset of comorbidities that are found in this disorder to a better degree. And we can also define MECP2 duplication syndrome against other developmental epileptic encephalopathies or brain disorders. And that way we can understand the unique needs of this disorder. We're looking to examine the determinants of quality of life in this disorder, not only for patients with MECP2 duplication syndrome, but also for caregivers and also the family. And that's an important distinction to make because caregivers often are parents, but sometimes they're not. Sometimes they are siblings. Sometimes they are other family members. So we really want to understand that better. And finally, we want to give particular attention to recurrent infections in this disorder and epilepsy, because we know that they carry quite a particular burden in MECP2 duplication syndrome. We want to investigate the coping strategies and support needs uh, when, treating recurrent, uh, when, when treating these two aspects of the disorder in children with MECP2 duplication syndrome. So moving forward, we first said that we need to develop uh, a database. So we developed the MECP2 duplication database over a year and a half. And here in the middle of the screen, we have a very beautiful logo created by Dinah Mendoza. Dinah is uh, a mother to a very beautiful boy with MECP2 duplication syndrome. And she is one of the most ardent supporters of championing for research in this disorder and also supporting out in volunteering capacities and also helping to fundraise. And she's helped out here by creating this logo for us, which represents the collective efforts of all the families involved in this study and also all the researchers on our team. So I really want to thank you for doing that for us, Dinah. Um, in creating the in the creation of the, the database, we said that we need to ask the right questions in order to bridge these gaps in the knowledge. So in 2019, we formed a consumer reference group, which was composed of a small and intimate group of very active and committed parents that helped us develop our questionnaire. We held a, a large Zoom call and we followed up with uh, interviews and phone calls to understand what is it that we need to be asking as researchers that will be able to answer those prominent questions at the back of the mind of a lot of parents? There's a lot of questions we can ask. And in the development of this questionnaire, we have close to 400 questions. So 
beyond that, there's even more questions we can ask, but we can only ask a limited amount at a time. So we, we asked those questions um, to parents and they, they gave feedback to us and we developed a questionnaire. And this questionnaire is broken up into two parts and I'd like to briefly go over those subheadings so you know what we're asking. There are two parts. The first part is asking questions about your child with MECP2 duplication syndrome. The second part is about the family. So we're looking at early experiences and early development, looking at that neonatal period. We're looking at regression. Whilst we know regression is part of this disorder and we know a lot of times it does seem to occur with the onset of epilepsy, what we need is greater granularity to the understanding of how this regression occurs and what type of skills are lost and whether that type of loss is rapid or slow. Those are the type of questions we're asking. We're looking at current function, cardiopulmonary health, epilepsy, gastrointestinal health, ENT infections, other medical conditions, such as musculoskeletal health, sleep quality, behaviors such as those related to autism, uh, puberty, we've heard reports of precocious puberty that we want to look into, medications, hospital admissions, schooling options, particularly for those that have special needs, and then the quality of life for children with MECB2 duplication syndrome. And then the second part looks at quality of life for the caregiver and the family. So we developed this questionnaire to answer those questions and we are uh, administering it through those that partake in the MD base. So this whole process took about a year and a half, as I was saying, and throughout that time, we constantly revised the questionnaire by going back to parents and involving them in that process of developing it and making sure that our online platform where we're administering the questionnaire runs smoothly. This whole process is really important because it makes sure that we are asking uh, Im the important questions in a sensitive manner. And that whole piloting process took many, many months. And I want to again, shine the spotlight on the small group of parents that helped us pilot these sections. Thank you so much to Dinah, Christy, Jessica, Melissa, Michelle, Teresa, Kathy, Colleen, Brooks, Jessica, and Holly. Uh, I really wanna reassure you that you have left a footprint in the, 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 the path of uh, MECP2 duplication syndrome research moving forward, and it's a very honorable step to take. So thank you for volunteering your time to, to help current families and future families uh, in, in this disorder. So that was the most, that was most of 2019. Uh, here I'd like to um, show you a quick video of how easy it is to participate in this, in this study. Um, so this is the online platform. Uh, the questionnaire is administered online. All you need is access to the internet and a device such as a laptop or a tablet or a phone. Uh, once you register your contact details, we give you a um, unique set of login credentials for your child. You log in, you can see the available questionnaires, the questionnaires that you've started. Uh, and, and that's because you can do this question in multiple settings, sittings, sorry. Uh, you can save and come back at a later date. So we press continue. We're taken to the introduction page, click here to proceed, consent, explanation about the different parts. And then you're taken to this page where it shows you which section you've completed last time where you need to continue onwards from. And we can see the navigation panels at the very top. You don't need to do this chronologically. And we utilize um, conditional branching logic. So you may not need to actually fill out the whole questionnaire. If you answer no to having seizures in your child, you may not need to complete this section so the questionnaire is not as long uh, for you. And finally, you can provide feedback at the end and you can see you can save and submit certain sections and come back later. Uh, and then once we log out, we're taken back to the home screen of Telethon Kids Institute. So it's very simple. Um, moving on to 2020, uh, just before we launched the database in April, uh, back in the tail end of January, uh, the 31st to the 1st of February, Dr. Leonard and I had the real great opportunity to attend uh, the MECP2 Duplication Syndrome Family Conference in Houston, Texas. That was a very, very lucky time for us. We managed to attend that before um, March where the COVID-19 pandemic really hit the US. So we managed to sneak that one in. And it was amazing to hear about the therapeutic research that was occurring. It was amazing to meet the other researchers that 
we've been reading about, we've been talking to via Zoom and via phone calls and hear about the research. And it was very motivating. Um, and in particular, meeting the parents was even more motivating. Uh, on the left, there we see Aaron and his beautiful boy. Um, he co-founded and also supports the MECP2 Duplication Foundation, which I'd like to uh, shine a spotlight onto uh, at the very end. On the right, we have Colleen, who is also a fantastic parent who co-founded the 4-1 Project, which is now rebranded into the Cure MDS group. And then in the middle, we have lovely Bethany. Uh, I know she's listening in, so hello there, Beth. Uh, and we also have um, Dr. Mary Jones in the middle. And I'd like to pay special tribute to her. Unfortunately, Dr. Mary Jones passed away uh, towards the end of last year. And Dr. Mary Jones is a, um, a, a physician who really looked after uh, children with rare childhood disorders, such as Rett syndrome and related ones, such as MECP2 duplication syndrome. And that's the reason why she was at the conference, because she really cares about these families. And um, I haven't had the chance to work with her, but I know she was very important to a lot of you. So I would like to pay special tribute to her and thank her for her work. And uh, that was a very motivating experience. It really filled Dr. Leonard and my, and my heart and our whole research team moving forward. And then afterwards, coming back, we smoothed out all the kinks for the, for the online um, database. And we launched MD Base on the 13th of April last year. So that was about 11 months ago. So since the launch until now in 2021, we've been inviting families to be a part of our study. We've been collecting your responses and I'd like to break down where you're all from. So looking at this world map, we have over a hundred families being involved in America, in, in North America, sorry, uh, 13 from Canada, 92 from the US. We have only three families from South America and they're actually all from Brazil. And I think this highlights one of the limitations of research such as this, and that's that a lot of the communication, well, sorry, most of it uh, in our research team and also administering the questionnaire, it's all done in English. So there is a language barrier and we are trying to address this issue by creating French and Spanish versions of the questionnaire, but that will take time and, and resources and we're slowly working on that. So unfortunately we can only um, be in contact with three families from, from South America, but there's obviously more. There's more from uh, Europe, uh, 26 from the UK, uh, 40 across uh, Europe, from uh, countries such as Denmark, the, the, the Netherlands, Italy, Germany, um, Czech Republic. We have five from Asia and they're from Taiwan, Japan, uh, UAE, Turkey, and then across Oceania, um, which covers New Zealand and Australia, we have 29 families. So overall, that's um, about a little over 200 families. And I think it points to another fact, and that's how rare this disorder actually is. There's more than 200 families involved in the MB base currently. The literature suggests that there has been over 500 reported cases, although some of them may be duplicates appearing in multiple studies, but there are a lot more than that. There's very little epidemiological type research going on and has been, uh, has been produced. Our research team uh, published uh, a little bit of research about two years ago based on Australian data. And we identified based on um, the, the, the population here in Australia that the birth prevalence of MECP2 duplication syndrome in Australia is one in every 150,000 live births. Uh, because this is a disorder that affects primarily boys, if we're looking just at male birth, that's one in every 100,000 uh, uh, births there. So it is an incredibly rare disorder, but there are a lot more cases out there we know. We just have to work hard uh, to contact them and reach them. So, so we ask in our efforts, if you possibly know any families that may be interested in partaking in the database that have not had the chance yet, please feel free to share our information with them. We would really love to invite them to be part of our, our research and our family. So moving on to what we know so far. Um, here I will present some of the uh, existing literature. There is uh, quite a bit in the, in, in the few decades um, since, and a little bit about our preliminary data. So in the MD base, we have received responses on 141 uh, boys, making up 88% of, of the population. And we've received uh, responses on 19 girls, which makes up 12% of the population. Looking at the median age, the, the boys are slightly younger in the study population, 
at 9.7 years old and for females they're closer to 11 years old and and this is important when we're discussing particular characteristics that are dependent on age such as the development of scoliosis or regression or developing particular skills that does depend on age so it's important that we make a note of that one of the questions we asked was um were there any diagnoses prior to the current diagnosis of MECP2 duplication syndrome? Out of the 146 responses, 86 of you said yes, which is close to 60%. And that's on the top table there. So out of those previous diagnoses, looking at the second table on the bottom, what, what were those previous diagnoses? Um, the most common one was global developmental delay. And that's not necessarily wrong because global developmental delay is a part of this syndrome. Um, and autism and ADHD can, 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 uh, are related as well. However, there are some other ones that are incorrect and are considered misdiagnoses, such as cerebral palsy and Prader-Willi syndrome. And there were some other um, more uncommon ones which received one response of, uh, of a diagnosis. And uh, what this slide probably highlights is that there needs to be better characterization of this disorder so that we can prevent some of these misdiagnoses in the future. And that's really important to, to recognize. We looked at communication skills. So from this point onwards, the literature is highlighted in the columns that are pink and the data from our current study is highlighted in the columns that are purple, the MD base. So in the literature, um, that we've been reviewing, um, it appears that uh, two thirds of children present with absent speech, whereas in our study population, this can be as high as three quarters of children. Uh, then we looked at some other skills uh, related to communication. Babbling is mentioned in the literature, but no proportion is ever given. In our study population, 40% of children uh, acquire babbling. We're looking at the use of communication aids as well, which has not been covered in the literature. This may be including communication devices, using the pod, uh, as an example, and 35% uh, of children in our study population require or, or utilize communication aids. Then uh, it was reassuring to find that um, uh, the proportion of children that were able to use few words or limited speech was roughly the same across the literature and our study population, roughly a quarter of children. So breaking that down in the second table uh, underneath, um, roughly 20% of our study population uh, could use single words and then less, um, about 5% and 6% could use phrases and sentences respectively. And I think what this highlights is that speech delay is definitely a part of this disorder. Looking at sitting and walking milestones. So these are time to event um, analysis graphs. So what we've done here is we've asked you whether your child can sit or walk. And if so, at what age did they acquire that skill? And we plugged it into the statistical software in order to provide these graphs that, that, can, that can tell us the likelihood of developing those skills for other children. And so if we look at the graph on the left-hand side, first of all, we see a blue line and a red line. The blue line represents girls and the red line represents boys. And we can see the likelihood of sitting is on the y-axis or the vertical line, the vertical axis. And on the bottom, we see uh, the age in years. So what we, can, what we can tell from this graph is that 85% learn to sit, which is pretty good. And 50% uh, learn to sit by one year. If we look at the graph on the right-hand side, we can see that there's a bit more of a difference between boys and girls. We can see that it appears that girls are more likely to learn to walk uh, earlier than boys. Uh, from this graph, we can see a half learn to walk and roughly 50% learn to walk by just over four years. And these two results alone also show that gross motor development and delay is also part of this, this disorder, which we all knew. But it's important and it's probably helpful for us to have some of these statistics and these numbers to know, particularly for future parents. Looking at some of these other reported gross motor functions and signs of movement disorders, uh, we looked at acquisition of sitting. Um, most, most children will, will learn to sit. Looking at crawling, our study shows that 69% of children in our population learn to crawl, and then roughly a half uh, learn to walk, which is slightly lower than what the literature suggests. Um, the literature also covered some other movement disorder-related signs, such as ataxia or a broad-based gait, which is an adaptation to perhaps truncal hypotonia or truncal weakness. 
We also have spasticity and cryoform movements. And I do believe that there is, there is um, uh, room for recommendations to be made in, in terms of some of those things, such as, for example, there have been recommendations of using Botox in injections to treat spasticity. And there's, th th this highlights a lot of what we're trying to do with the results we find as well. But moving forward, um, I want to highlight two things. First of all, there are some references at the end of, at the bottom, sorry, of some of these slides. Uh, all of those are available at the very end of this presentation, and you can access those later um, by pausing at that slide and, and searching those up. Or you can email me, and I'm very happy to talk to you about whatever resources you need. Also, from this point onwards, if you look at Corea for movements, which is the final row in this table, you'll notice it's reported in 17 patients out of 27 where, where they looked at it. I want to highlight that this um, is something to be taken with a grain of salt, particularly when there are small changes in number over these um, small, small sample sizes, it can really skew the data. Uh, we, we can say that we have a little bit more confidence in looking at some of these percentages when we're looking at the ones above where we have digits in the, in the hundreds. So some of these statistics do need to be taken with a grain of salt. So moving forward, looking at regression. So the literature suggests that uh, there has been a reporting of generalized developmental or intellectual regression in about 41% of children. In our study, this is considerably higher. It's, it's been found to be reported in 59% of children. We kind of broke it down into the types of regression, and I, I believe we look at it more in depth than uh, other studies, as you can see, the numbers are quite low in the literature. So if we're just focusing on the right-hand side column, looking at our study population, 29% of children uh, had regression of speech or communication skills. 45% of children uh, had regression of gross motor skills. And the most commonly reported loss of a gross motor skill is walking. And then 14% of children in our population had a regression of purposeful hand use and they were described as uh, playing with particular toys or using utensils to feed oneself. And uh, th there's a lot more to that, that where there are other questions that we ask that we don't have the time to present today, unfortunately, but you can look forward to those in the publications to come and, and we'll be we, we, we will be presenting that information at a later date. Looking at recurrent infections. We know that recurrent infections is a major component of this disorder. And there has been research coming out discussing the immunocompromised profile of phenotype found in MECP2 duplication syndrome. There has been research looking at the lower titer of IgG antibodies, um, IgA, IgM. And uh, what, what has been highlighted in the past is a lot of lower respiratory tract infections. We're looking at the first row there. Uh, between the literature and our study, approximately three quarters of children uh, were reported to have at least one episode of a respiratory tract infection. And we're usually looking at pneumonia or bronchitis. Then for some of the other types of infections, they haven't been given so much focus on. And, and we, we decided that uh, with the recent literature in the past five years to the past decade, we're focusing more on that. So we, 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 highlight that, we highlighted that in our ENT section, we're looking at uh, pharyngitis and tonsillitis. In our study population, 64% of children had at least one episode of those. And for a lot of children, it's recurrent and multiple episodes. Looking at sinusitis, which has not been reported in, in the literature, 36% of children in our population had it. Otitis media or uh, middle ear infections, quite a stark contrast between the literature being 31% of children being reported to have that. In our study population, 62% had at least one episode of ear infections. Urinary tract infections, that one is quite interesting and we'll touch upon that in a second, 36%. And I wanted to mention sepsis. Sepsis is not as common as the other types of infections, but it can be quite deadly. It's a life-threatening inflammatory response to infection in the body. And I think it needs to be highlighted in, in uh, future publications as well. So moving on to respiratory health, we have asthma here. So in our study population, in the MD-based study, a quarter of children were reported to have asthma. Uh, generalized breathing problems are also reported in the literature. We have reporting of chronic coughing and wheezing. Also croup as well. And I know croup is technically an upper airway respiratory tract infection, 
But uh, I did include it here because it can produce that stride or, or that barking cough that's associated uh, with it. So in our population, a, a quarter of uh, children had croup. We have pulmonary hypertension as well. And looking at the number here of 5%, in the literature and 4% in our study population, it seems like it may not be a, a major clinical uh, focal point. However, pulmonary hypertension has been reported to be the cause of death in um, I believe three or four cases in the literature. So I do believe that it requires um, a clinical focus. Um, we're looking at bronchomalacia, laryngo, pharyngo, and tracheomalacia, where there is a, a, a um, abnormal softening of those uh, regions of tissue and they can all contribute to breathing problems. And I put an asterisk in our column because it's been mentioned by parents, but I still need to go back and collate that data. But these are some of the respiratory health issues. And I think it highlights the respiratory burden of this phenotype of this disorder here. We also asked whether your child experienced a respiratory problem requiring hospital admission. A staggering 111 of you out of 138 responses or 80% of you said yes. So there's a lot more to this question. We're trying to see when these hospital admissions seem to be occurring. And although this has already been mentioned before in the literature, looking at our preliminary data, which is not presented here, it is seemingly so the first two to three years of life are where a lot of the respiratory problems cause hospital admissions. The type, the, the, the length of stay and all of those type of questions that we would like to report on will unfortunately have to come at a later date. There's a lot of data that we're combing through, but this is a little bit of a taster of what, a, what the, the, the type of things that we're trying to characterize for um, future parents. Looking at cardiovascular health, we saw that um, a fifth or 22% of patients reported congenital health defects, and these include uh, atrial and ventricular septal defects. We're looking at patent ductus arteriosus, stenosis, or a narrowing of certain heart valves. And all of these may have a clinical um, implication. So we would like to break that down in the future, but for now, this is one of the findings we have. Looking at epilepsy, we can see here in epilepsy that males are more likely to develop uh, seizures prior to females because the red line is coming before the blue line. We can see that over 60% develop seizures and a half will develop seizures by eight years of age. So unfortunately seizures may not appear early on in childhood and may appear later on. And um, I, I know parents understand this, but having numbers are, are very important for, for that empowerment and understanding of what may be to be expected at what age. So epilepsy, we looked at um, the presence of seizures Reassuringly, again, between the literature and our uh, study population, roughly a half of patients were reported to have seizures or epilepsy. And then in the literature, 67%, and in our study population, 71% of children were reported to have treatment refractory seizures. And I believe that there needs to be a lot more uh, analysis of this particular aspect. For those that have treatment refractory seizures, are we using monotherapy? Are we using multiple types of anti-epileptic uh, medications? Is it being used in conjunction with other, um, you know, sort of treatments such as a ketogenic diet, a vagus nerve stimulation, um, brain stimulation? A lot more needs to be, um, you know, looked at too in terms of that aspect. And I also wanted to mention uh, the diagnosis of lennox gastaut syndrome. 35% of children in the literature had this and uh, compared to a quarter of the patients in our study population here were reported to have this. And this is a concurrent diagnosis of this very rare childhood onset form of epilepsy where we have these concurrent types of seizures occurring with a particular reading on an ECG. And it is very dangerous. And I think there needs to be more um, uh, research focus into that aspect uh, of uh, uh, lennox gastaut syndrome being diagnosed concurrently with MACP2 duplication syndrome. And that's something that we will comment on in, in, in the publications to come. Um, we broke down um, the, the epilepsy questions into what type of seizure types there were, uh, what were the common triggers. And we won't go through all of this in depth. There's a lot here. Looking at the table on the left-hand side, it appears some of the more common types of seizures 
And I note that some of uh, children can have multiple types of seizures. It appears that we have tonic, clonic, the grand mal, the drop seizures, the mild clonic and absent seizures being some of the more common ones. And when we're talking about uh, seizure triggers, we're looking at infections, uh, sleep deprivation, uh, fever, and arousal from sleep being some of the more common triggers for um, a, a seizure episode. But other ones include emotional upset, feeding, uh, facial tactile stimuli, sudden noise. And there were some other reported ones such as um, exposure to high heat or bright lights. And there's, there's a lot more to this section and this is only some of the, the questions we're trying to answer right now. Moving on to gastrointestinal problems. And I think this um, is really important as well when we're discussing MECP2 duplication syndrome. Pardon me. Uh, abdominal bloating has been reported in the literature. Um, as so has, um, uh, but air swallowing hasn't. So we looked into that and it appears that air swallowing has been present or in the past occurring in about a quarter of our study population. And this, this can inform possibly abdominal bloating. Uh, uh, bowel or pseudointestinal obstruction has been reported as well in our study population. This is reported in 21% of, of the children. We have constipation. Constipation is a very um, important clinical focal point. It's been reported in 73% of, of patients in the literature, but in our study, this is 94%. There's, there's, there's a bit of a difference there. And um, this is possible due to the way that we're, we're asking the question. We're, we're asking about the episodes of constipation in the past and or current. That can contribute to a higher percentage. But I think the, the, the more important thing to note is that it highlights that constipation is a serious issue here. And it really impacts the quality of life of children with this syndrome. Other, uh, other aspects that are explored in the literature include drooling, uh, generalized swallowing difficulties, and under that comes aspiration. Aspiration is dangerous because aspiration of um, liquids or food content can lead to aspiration pneumonia, which can cause hospital admissions and sometimes, unfortunately, um, even death. And in our study population, aspiration was found to be in more than 50% of, of the children in our study. So that's definitely something that requires um, some recommendations in the literature. We have generalized feeding problems occurring in uh, close to two thirds in our study population. Obviously this has implications for the use of um, nasal gastric feeding or gastrostomy feeding. Um, and then we also have gastroesophageal reflux, which seems to be quite significant in our study population. We have 81% of children having had this in the past and or currently. And gastroesophageal reflux is also something that's really dangerous as well. It can cause um, lung infections. It can cause pneumonia. Um, it, it can cause a whole host of issues. So it's really important that we're trying to see which of these symptoms require more focus on and then highlight that moving forward. So we're really interested at the end in uh, compiling all of this important information and creating you know, clinical guidelines or at least contributing to it if we can. So moving forward, looking at musculoskeletal health, we were really interested in seeing whether bone breakages and fractures uh, were, were, were common uh, in this disorder. And it's been mentioned in the literature. And um, in our, in our um, study, we found that a third of children or 33% of children were reported to have at least one bone breakage or fracture in their life. And we've asked the question of what was the reason and we can break that down in the publications to come. But it appears a lot of the time it's due to a fall from a drop seizure. And so one of the other questions to ask is, is there possibly some uh, underlying um, uh, epigenetic uh, mechanism that can lead to osteoporosis or low bone density? And it appears that some patients have been reported to be diagnosed with osteoporosis or low bone density. And it can be related to um, other things such as diet as well. But um, that, that's something to, to make a note of moving forward. We also looked at scoliosis. And so looking at the right-hand column, we, we found that 23% of children in our study had scoliosis, kyphosis, or both, which is a curvature of the spine in different planes. And I think this has important clinical um, implications as well, because uh, scoliosis can impact respiratory breathing. It can impact movement and quality of life. 
And there are things we need to consider, such as whether we need bracing or vertebral fusion. Um, so that's, that's something that we've highlighted here and we'll comment on more in the future. So that's musculoskeletal health. Um, looking at urogenital issues, I believe that urogenital issues are also underreported in the literature as well. And understandably so, because a lot of these do require radiological findings. And uh, we, we can look at some of these issues right now. So some of these problems that have been mentioned in the literature include vesicle ureteral reflux, which is a backflow of urine. Um, we have bladder dilation and hypertrophy. We have hydronephrosis, which is a buildup or swelling of the kidney with fluid, which is usually the urine. We have pyelonephritis, which is an infection of the kidney. We have um, kidney stones. We have ureteral dilation. And I think what this highlights is that some of these may uh, influence the reporting of some of these other symptoms. For example, with vesicle ure ureteral reflux, what we might get is uh, hydronephrosis what we might get is an infection of the kidney. When we're looking at um, the UTIs in a previous slide, looking at the return to infections, UTIs can cause ureteral dilation. It can cause pyelonephritis. So I think the urogenital aspect of MECP2 duplication syndrome requires further research. And um, you know we, we need to link it to other aspects of this disorder. One thing that's highlighted is that renal stones could be impacted by the use of a ketogenic diet. And um, that's, that's a recommendation we're looking to make in the future, but, but for now, I'll, I'll keep it as, as this. Um, some other reported genital issues include undescended testes, such as cryptocortism and the presence of a, of a micropenis there. Um, a, a, a question we were really interested in asking was episodes of urinary retention. Now, in the literature, there's been the mention of a neurogenic bladder about two times, but no one has ever looked at urinary retention. And as part of the development of the questionnaire, we were asking parents, you know, what, what is a particular feature that hasn't been really discussed yet? And we were kind of combing through online forums and communities discussing questions asked by parents. One of them is urinary retention. And it appears through our question that 28% of children uh, have uh, the presence of urinary retention, which is quite interesting. And how many of those retain urine for more than, than a day? Well, 10%, which is quite significant. And this is an important thing to actually highlight because urinary retention can actually cause UTIs. It can cause bladder and kidney damage, and it can also cause urinary incontinence. So I think the whole urogenital uh, picture of, of this phenotype really requires further research here, yeah, again, as I highlight. Then we looked at behavior. We, we looked at symptoms of autism, and I want to highlight a really seminal paper by, by Ramoki et al. in 2009 at the bottom there that, that really kick-started a lot of this. Um, we, we asked whether there was a diagnosis of autism in our population, and we found that 26% of children received the diagnosis of autism this is quite a stark contrast with the diagnosis of autism in the literature being 68%. There's quite a stark contrast there. And it could be due to the way that we're asking the question, the, the, the fact that other studies use particular scales, such as the ADOS, uh, using psychologists to actually um, certify the presence of uh, autism in these populations. And that's something we'll, we'll address in the future. What, what's more important to highlight is that autism or, the, or these traits are an aspect of MECP2 duplication syndrome and it's related in this way. Some of these other uh, symptoms that have been reported, which we won't go in depth into, include anxiety, gaze avoidance or difficulty using eye gaze, being upset or distressed over changes in routine, impaired social interactions, repetitive behaviors and stereotypical behaviors. So moving on, we, we looked at hand stereotypies. We, we kind of looked at some of the more common ones. Uh, first off, 86% 80, of children in our study population were reported to have these hand stereotypies, which are these repetitive sort of midline hand movements. Um, we have flapping, mouthing, clapping, ringing, clasping, biting, and, and, and all of these other ones, such as um, you know, having fists together, being very common in, in, in children with MECP2 duplication syndrome. We also looked at other behavioral features and mood disorders. And they include aggression or temper tantrums, 
uh, attentional difficulties. Perhaps this is related to some of that ADHD uh, diagnoses. Uh, depression, that's more common in um, car carrier females. We have uh, a reporting of high pain tolerance in more than 50% of children in the pituitary duplication syndrome. And I find this to be quite interesting uh, because this is obviously related um, to some of those bone breakages. I think um, I, I, a lot of parents um, will have heard before. And in my personal um, communication with parents, Sometimes accidents happen and it may not be discovered until later because um, your, your, your child may not express pain in the same way as other children. And uh, I had the opportunity to meet a very lovely boy in, in, in Japan. And um, I, I, know, I know his mother is listening and, and he, he was biting his fingers as one of those uh, stereotypes. And his, he bit his fingers to the nub. And part of that is this high pain tolerance. He just doesn't feel that pain. And, and what's to be said there? There's so many questions we were asking here that we want to expand upon. Uh, other ones include hyperactivity and a poor sense of danger. Um, interestingly enough, in multiple conversations, I've had this mentioned to me and uh, we, we had that question in as part of a, uh, a behavioral scale we have included in the questionnaire. So um, we, we, we've reported that in 80% in of, of children in our study. Moving forward, we're looking at teeth grinding or bruxism. Um, and, and we found this to be quite interesting. It, it, it's quite similar to uh, Rett syndrome. Uh, this is reported in more than 50% of the children in our study. And um, it seems as if teeth grinding is more common during waking hours, but it can happen at night. And it can also happen uh, both during waking hours and at night. So approaching autonomic problems, um, we have reported issues of breath holding, reported issues of hyperventilation, uh, vasal motor troubles in general are reported in the literature, but breaking that down, we have this really interesting finding of levita of the limbs, which is this mottling or this purplish bluish discoloration of the hands and feet, uh, which you know, point to poor circulation. And that's related to the final role there, which is cold hands and or feet or problems regulating body temperature, which is an interesting thing because it's been only reported in four patients in the literature. We sought to ask this question in our study population and we broke that question down. We found that 69% of um, children in our population reported having cold hands or feet. And 58% of the children in our population had problems regulating body temperature, in particular, uh, feeling really cold when they were dressed with a lot of uh, warm clothing. And the, the vice versa also was reported as well. I think there needs to be further investigation of, of this moving forward. Sleep problems. We're looking at uh, generalized sleep disturbances in more than a half of uh, patients reported in the literature. Um, other things we investigated include sleep apnea, Hypersomnia, which is excessive sleepiness during the day. We have reporting of nocturnal awakening and also sleep-wake rhythm disorder um, at, at night. And I'm being uh, conscious of the time, so I'm moving forward without discussing these particular percentages. Um, what are the findings to come? And, and this is really to highlight what are the publications uh, you, you, you can look forward to and we will be discussing in the future with you together. You can look forward to um, our, our work on a full review of the current clinical understanding of MECP2 duplication syndrome, the biological studies, and the therapeutic research that's going on right now. Really, really exciting stuff coming out of different labs, particularly uh, Dr. Huda Zogby's. Um, we're going to be expanding the clinical profile of MECP2 duplication syndrome. We will be working to understand disease severity in early years versus later years. We'll be trying to understand and determine the important uh, domains for quality of life for children with this disorder and the family and caregivers and understanding the particular needs of caretakers. Finally, we will be exploring the coping strategies and support needs of the family when we're talking about recurrent infections and seizures, which we find to be quite important right now. Um, I want to end this, this uh, uh, part of the, the talk with this photo. Um, a few months ago, we had uh, the opportunity to invite the only two families in Perth who have children with MECP2 duplication syndrome to our institute to talk to them about their lives and also talk to them about our research. And I believe it was quite motivating uh, both ways. Um, and I think I speak on behalf of Dr. Downs and Dr. Leonard 
when I say these encounters, such as the the, the Houston conference and, and this light little lunch, it's very, it really fills our heart and it provides us with a lot of motivation and it gives us the confidence that what we're doing will help families in one way or another. And we hope that with the research that we publish in the year to follow with that previous slide, we'll provide you with some answers and ho ho hopefully that will be achieved. So um, how can you be involved in our research? Chances are, if you're signed up to this webinar, you're already being involved, but on the off chance that you are not part of our study yet, or if you want to, you know, um, send out our, our information to other families, this is the link to register your contact details. I'm going to post this elsewhere because I know this is a video that you can't click. Uh, we will call you, invite you to be a part of our study. We'll send you login details so you can access the questionnaire and you will be receiving our updates on our research by email. So you won't miss out on these future webinars. If you are a clinician or researcher and you would like to collaborate, please reach out to us. You can email me there. Um, and I would love to acknowledge everyone in this call. I want to acknowledge all the families involved in MECBT duplication research fundraising, uh, all, all of your birthdays where you guys, instead of asking for gifts, you ask for, for a, a small donation to support the research moving forward. That doesn't go by unnoticed. All the advocacy groups here, yeah, thank you to our consumer reference group for the MD base. Thank you to Dinah for creating the logo for our database. Thank you to the research team here. Thank you to Dr. Leonard, Dr. Downs for being my mentors and, 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 and spearheading this uh, research effort. Thank you to the Rep Syndrome Research Trust, Cure MDS, uh, the Family Talk page for all of your support. Uh, French and Spanish advocacy groups, which I cannot pronounce the name of, sorry. The MECP2 Duplication Foundation coming out of Arizona. And uh, thank you to all of you for listening to me, me talk for the better part of an hour. And I would really love to just um, quickly go over these reference slides for people to pause on if they're watching a recording later. So here you go. And I would love to transition to a Q&A session with uh, uh, Dr. Leonard and Dr. Downs. Thank you very much. Daniel, can I just ask a quick question? Yes, absolutely. For the, when you were going through all of the percentages and number of kids that had various, when there was a dash, did that mean you didn't ask the question or does that mean it was zero? Zero absolutely. responses. Yes, if, if it was a dash in um, either of the columns, it means that it hasn't been uh, reported. Uh, sorry, for, for our column, it means that we didn't ask that question. Okay. Um, an, an example I can give you is, for example, we didn't ask anything about um, hypotonia. We didn't, sorry, we, we did, but I didn't report it today. We didn't really ask anything about intellectual disability because we know that it's already a prominent aspect of this disorder. It, it's not something that needs to be reported. We want to divert most of this research attention with the limited amount of questions we can ask in this questionnaire to the things that parents wanted to be asked early on in 2019 in that call. Okay, thank you. And um, I'm gonna go through some of these questions um, from, from Anne, can we get the pre presentation after all? Um, this presentation has been recorded and I believe it will be uploaded to YouTube. And um, once we get that link, we'll be able to disseminate it so you can rewatch this and, and pause at certain points. Isn't that right, Monica? Yes, I'll, I'll put the, um, I'll see if I can put the link. I mean, if, we, it's, um, it's the YouTube channel, the Rett Syndrome Research Trust YouTube channel. If you go to the Rett Syndrome Research Trust website, click on the YouTube icon, click on playlists, and you'll see that there's an MECP2 duplication syndrome playlist. And that's where we're gonna add it. Thank you on very Monday. much. Um, Hopefully on Monday. Thank you very much for that, Monica. That, I, I appreciate all the work into editing of that video as well. Um, I'll, I'll be posting it on social media and on different platforms, so. Um, you, you, you won't miss it if you're in the family chat on Facebook. Um, Stephen, never been asked to be in a study, just call the families. Um, I, I, I have been quite a gadfly on social media. I've been posting constantly uh, on all of the small um, pages um, about, about our research. Um, that has been our main way of, of ascertaining cases and generating interest. It, it is very difficult when it comes to a rare disorder. 
And so early on, we, we, we found that the family talk support page on Facebook, which is comprised of, I think, about 1.4K members now, is our main source of access to families. So that's why we, we, we ask in this webinar, if you don't have access to Facebook, but you somehow heard about this or vice versa, if you know of a family who, who might be interested, but doesn't have access to Facebook, please uh, contact me and we can organize to, 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 to invite them to the study. Um, so Stephen, we can, we can probably catch up after this call. I'll find a way to, to find you or contact you, or you can contact me. Um, Bernard, uh, thank you for your excellent presentation, impressive data. Thank you very much, Bernard. I, I look forward to catching up with you in, in the future. Uh, and I speak on behalf of Dr. Leonard and Dr. Downs. And it was really nice meeting you at the Houston conference. Thank you. From Amy, how do we change or update our info in the database? Uh, for example, Megan was not having seizures when I responded last year, or do you not want us to update it regularly? That's actually a very uh, good question. Um, we, 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 our, our question there um, collects data at a cross-sectional time point. So at a certain time point, if we are updating certain sections, but not others, it may be misleading because it says that at a certain age, something has developed, but something else hasn't yet. And we don't know that if you're only changing one section and not another. What we can possibly consider moving forward is to look at creating a longitudinal study. So perhaps there could be an opportunity for a further study. And we ask you um, some other questions and you can answer again at a second time point and we can map the development of certain things over time. But at this certain point in time, um, I would say uh, thank you very much for your enthusiasm of wanting to update that uh, data that we're collecting. But I would um, tend to say, please um, don't, don't log in and make those changes as of now. Um, would you agree, Helen and Jenny? Yeah, yes. But I think it's a very good idea for the future. And we may be able to amend the database so that you can do that in the future, but we haven't done it yet. But in our other studies of other rare disorders, we have definitely collected longitudinal data, and that would be our, our aim you know, in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Uh, thank you very much, Samantha. Uh, I really appreciate that. Uh, from Bernard, um, one question. If you have a symptom reported from a parent that you are not sure about, uh, can you follow up with them for clarification? Ab absolutely. So while some of um, these type of studies ask for an anonymized response, we really keep up to date with, with parents in their responses. So we read them. And if we require any clarification, we, we, we do email or we do call if, if parents uh, prefer, and we, we get clarification in that way. So we are really trying to um, uh, create as uh, complete a data set as possible in, in, in that manner, in that manner, sorry. Um, so that's a great question. So there is a lot of follow-up and, and it is a lot of man hours. Um, from Amy, what did the asterisk mean in results column? Not asked or no findings. Great question again, and I apologize. I should have explained better, but the asterisk means that it's, if the asterisk was in the literature column, it means that it's been mentioned but I didn't put it into this presentation because it was mentioned only once or twice, or it was a, a very low sample size and it kind of skews that percentage, it makes it look like if it's one out of two patients having something, it seems as if 50% of the population will have it, but that's a misrepresentation. If it was an asterisk in the MD base column, it meant that I've seen parents mention it, but I haven't had the time to collate that data yet. Um, so that's hopefully that answers your question. Um, it's the it's the hyphen that represents no findings are not asked. Um, from from oh thank you very much Monica for providing the the link to the YouTube channel. And thank you Stephen for your contact details. I will be contacting you afterwards. Um, and and awesome. I, I think that's all of the questions. Um, yeah, if anyone. So Actually, there's questions in the q and I think you were just looking at the chat. Oh, I see. Click on Q&A. Oh, there's much more. <laughs> okay. From Bethany. Are there any connections to families in Africa? That's the only habitable continent that doesn't have a response listed. Would the language translation to French or another language help? 
That's a very good question. You're, you're, you're very observant, Bethany. Uh, we, we, didn't, we don't have any families from Africa. Um, and the question of whether language translation to French would help. Yes, there, there are some regions where they, where they speak French. Um, we, we, we're, we're currently trying to find um, a translation to a French version of the questionnaire. Um, so that's, that's on the tables right now. Uh, we're not we're not too sure. I, I think as I addressed before, the, the way that we establish contact in the first place is actually through Facebook. We are also active on Instagram and Twitter, although it seems as if there's not a lot of activity on those pages. So Facebook really is where we're um, really trying to reach out to at this point in time. And then also word of mouth that really helps sometimes as well. So that's that's a great question, Bethany. Maybe, maybe we will have families in the future coming out of Africa, and that'll be interesting to, to find out. Uh, from Anne, uh, can we get the presentation after all? I, th I think I was already asked. Um, Bethany, has the prevalence of lordosis been explored? One of my sons has lordosis, but I didn't, didn't know if that occurred in other families as well. That's a great question. I believe I saw um, lordosis being reported in one patient, actually. I don't think it was reported in our study. Um, so Bethany, I'll make a note of that and I'll double check and I will send you that paper afterwards to see what that paper says. Um, but at this point in time, it doesn't seem like it's a very common occurrence. Um, Althea, is bone break spontaneous or traumatic in MECP2 duplication syndrome? Uh, in our question, when we ask about bone breakages or fractures, we also ask for the, the reason why. And um, for most of the responses, close to 100%, there is the reason why. Um, and, and, and as I was saying in the presentation, um, most of those reasons were related to an injury whilst playing or related to uh, a fall that comes from a drop seizure. Those were the two common ones. I couldn't really remember some of the other ones, but uh, none of them were really reported to be spontaneous. Um, so that's a good question. Thank you very much, David. Um, really appreciate that. Did you confirm the genetic diagnosis of the families registered? That's an ongoing process. Um, and absolutely, we are um, uh, ascertaining genetic records for children. Um, and we're also looking at um, genetic records uh, from parents as well, if available. We're, we're, we're trying to look at the X inactivation ratio. We're trying to look at the, the state of how skewed their, their um, blood tests is. So yes, we are following up and that's an ongoing process. Sometimes it can be difficult chasing up. Um, from Melissa, is there a breakdown in the ages of information such as kidney stones in patients over the age of 16 or younger? Very good question. Um, that's, a, that's a very good question. We're looking to um, provide analyses of these particular characteristics by age for a lot of characteristics, for a lot of the symptoms. And at this point in time, um, we, we haven't yet, just simply because we're still in the data collection phase and we're really trying to collect more responses. But in the future, we are definitely going to do that. Um, so you can look forward to, to that by age. In terms of the age brackets right now, we're not too sure that that will come a little later. Um, from Helen, is there any further research being done about carry mothers? That's a really good question. Um, so, so first off, we um, are looking at the quality of life of caregivers most of the time being mothers. But very specifically, your question is asking about further research for carry mothers. And we, we could be looking at the phenotype of carry mothers. We could be looking at the neuropsychiatric profile of carry mothers as well. We, we, we do know that it, uh, there is a neuropsychiatric profile. There are a lot of symptoms of anxiety, um, depression, and some, some other neuropsychiatric symptoms. Right now, I'm not too sure of the current research that might be happening in that sphere. And I know that we're not actively participating in it. So I'm, I'm sorry, I don't really have a really good answer for you there. Um, I, I, I apologize. What is the life expectancy for girls or boys? Right now, there, there is insufficient epidemiological data to answer that. A lot of studies do seem to look at uh, the presence of um, uh, uh, death before the age of 25 years. And a lot of the times, the reasons for uh, passing away include, uh, uh, include being related to seizures, uh, epileptic episodes, uh, recurrent infections, and then more recently, uh, what's been highlighted is pulmonary hypertension. 
but those only highlight the causes of death in those early causes of death. And um, it, it doesn't talk about the life expectancy. We don't have enough data yet to answer that question, unfortunately. Thank you very much, Ray. We really appreciate your, your, your compliment. Um, good morning. How about any data on potty training? Um, that's a good question. We, we don't have any data on potty training. Um, and I don't believe we actually asked a question on that, but we can make a note about this for, for further studies. And any comment on that, Helen or Jenny? Not really, no. It's something um, we probably should have thought about, but we, we didn't. No, I, I think, yeah. And I think it's important that we acknowledge that it's a very important issue for families and we, need to do, we do need to think further on that issue. And I think talking with our consumer reference group would be valuable in that regard. So thank you for raising that. Thank you very much, Jenny. Um, Ray, our geneticist knows nothing of MECP2. Do you have anything we can share to educate her as Mia gets no support at all? As she says, MECP2 doesn't affect girls at all. Um, obviously we know um, as part of this, this community that it does affect girls, but to a smaller proportion. I would love to catch up with you. Um, please email me and we can talk about the, the, the type of information you like. And I will type something up for you as well as give you a, a small package of um, individualized information for you to give to, to um, uh, your physician. So we, we can do that afterwards, but I, I'd love to do that for you. Um, hello, Brittany. Have you looked in the data at associations between proportion with symptoms of autism, developmental regression and epilepsy, the relationship between regression and epilepsy in autism spectrum disorder is an area of interest because of the hope that some developmental regression in idiopathic ASD could be caused by epilepsy and be reversible through using anti-seizure therapies. There is also overlap of language and autistic regression to epilepsy. Possibly acquired epileptic aphasia may present as a developmental language regression followed by autistic-like social communicative phenotype. Do you think this might be worth exploring? Um, possibly. That, that is a lot of information for me to digest as well. Um, uh, I, I'm not too sure. I'm definitely going to make a note of that and read it. Um, uh, I, I can only admit when I'm really not sure about whether that, that something is worth exploring or even if I know too much about it. So I'm going to make a note of that and, and we'll, 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 we'll answer you at a later date. Uh, anything to add on that, um, Jenny or, or Helen? Um, just just to say that it's it's a really um, uncertain for, for for lots of developmental epileptic encephalopathy sorry encephalopathy conditions as to what is associated with the developmental um, sort of abilities of the child and if epilepsy changes that or not that's a, that's un an uncertain question in the area and absolutely as Daniel just said it's it, it needs a lot of observation and a lot more observations to be clear in that regard awesome thank you very much um from Asa Hello, uh, when you are finished with the questionnaire, will you split data for girls and boys? We have a girl with very mild symptoms and it would be nice to see the data just for girls. Absolutely, Asa. Um, for the purpose of today's webinar, um, we, we, we couldn't afford to um, split that up. So we will definitely um, split it up into gender and also by age category as a previous question was asking. Uh, so you will definitely get some information there. Um, so thank you for asking that, it's a great question. Um, from Brittany, have you compared hand stereotypes in uh, MECP2 duplication syndrome with those characteristic of autism? And were these behavioral features more common in your population with autism symptoms? Great question. Definitely going to answer that in the analysis stage. Uh, right now, I haven't done that um, analysis or made those comparisons, but that's a great question. I really like it. So thank you for suggesting that. Um, cool. Um, from Brittany again, what do you think is the most promising future treatment options? Um, looking at antisense oligonucleotides as a potential therapeutic strategy, um, mentioning of Dr. Huda Zogby generating the humanized MDS model. Um, yes, absolutely. So there are multiple avenues of research right now, and I believe um, Dr. Suda and Dr. David um, here in this call could, could, could um, have, have better answers than myself. 
Um, but yes, it is really exciting. Very recently, Dr. Huda Zogby's lab generated a humanized model of the MECP2 duplication syndrome in mice. So previously, the, the, what was really exciting in 2015, coming out of Huda Zogby's lab, was looking at that version of the mice model, which carried one human MECP2 gene and a second gene of MECP2, but it was of a mice. More recently, the breakthrough is to generate this uh, mice model having two human copies of the MECP2 gene and then testing some of the therapeutic options of using antisense oligonucleotides to rescue the phenotype there. So that's really exciting. There's also been recent research on using siRNA to, to, to treat this um, disorder as a possible therapeutic. So that's really exciting as well. And then there's, there's, there's constant other studies such as drug screening uh, that I know is occurring. So um, on, on that front, it's all really exciting. Um, and, and I wanna thank you for um, bringing that up. And hopefully I've addressed- There's also a genome, genome editing study going on um, in Toronto. Oh yes, absolutely, absolutely. Thank you for that, Monica. Um, Tom, thanks, Daniel. Um, are there any plans to look at the effects of COVID-19 and the MECP2? Um, in terms of the, 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 the vaccination, or do, do you mean the impact of COVID-19 on possibly quality of life? I'm not, too, uh, I'm not too sure of what you mean there. In terms of vaccinations, I know a lot of parents have been asking online uh, whether, whether their child has received uh, the vaccination. And I myself can't profess to, to, to know how to answer that. But in terms of um, quality of life, when it comes to the impact of COVID-19, that's going to be a limitation of this study. So moving forward, um, we, in, in my phone calls to parents that have been part participating in the study ever since COVID-19 occurred, I had been asking parents to assume when they're answering those sections to ignore the effects of COVID-19, but it's still gonna be uh, a limitation of this study. And that's something we need to address in the publications moving forward. Uh, so thank you for asking that question. And if I didn't answer it, please follow up. Um, from Brittany, because there's such substantial clinical variability in individuals that cannot be expla explained by differences in mutations alone, have you thought about other types of data collection like biospecimens as they're doing in RET? In conjunction with longitudinal clinical assessment performed via the natural history component, have you thought about collecting all willing participants' blood and isolate plasma, DNA, and RNA? Could you have samples collected from family members? Also, could you use whole genome sequencing in order to be able to potentially evaluate for genetic modifiers of these diseases? So do you have the capacity to extend this natural history component beyond self-report? And what would be the infrastructure and cost? And who could we rally to get support for this? Such a lovely <laughs> and, and thought out response. It's really amazing that, that, that you know so much. Um, beyond the component of this current study and our ethics approval, uh, we will not be collecting any sort of, um, you know, biospecimens. I think if there's any um, sort of possible expansion, we could look at genotype phenotype associations, as we're collecting all of this genetic data from from children with this disorder, and also from parents as carrier mothers. What we can look is whether there is an association between certain genes and particular characteristics, but even then, that requires a lot of effort, and without with our small research team. Uh, we're, we're just looking to cover the points that we've made today, but it's possible that we can extend to genotype phenotype uh, re re research um, in the future. Do, do you have anything to add to that, uh, Jenny or Helen? Well, I think um, there are other people doing the, the, the question that Brittany asked probably should probably go to, to the Houston group because they are doing that sort of work. And oh, yes, they are with the biomarker study, the IONOS biomarker yeah. study. That's right. Yes, yes. So we're not really set up for it here, but it is being done elsewhere, which is complementary to what we're doing. Yeah, absolutely. And, and as a segue from what Helen just said, it's, it's not only complementary, I believe we need to work at being able to connect with other individuals, other groups who are doing research and be able to put our data together if that is possible. And, and we would love that to be able to happen so that we can really have a bigger picture, a deeper dive into all of as many interacting factors as we possibly can to get a better outcome for that child. Daniel, I have a question. If a, if a, if a biotech company um, wanted to access the data that's in your, um, some of the data in your database, how would they go about doing that? 
that's a really good question. And um, obviously collaboration is something that we're really interested in. And I think it's important for the benefit of researchers, clinicians, and families involved. Currently, um, we, 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 we have an ethics um, application, sorry, not ethics application, an ethics approval that limits us from uh, sharing as, as we please uh, this uh, confidential data um, collected from families. So if we were to pursue that avenue, which uh, we, 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 we would welcome, we would have to go through our ethics committee uh, ap approval at the university, first of all. Um, would you like to add anything, Helen or Jenny? But I'm just going to say that, you know, in relation to other rare disorders, we do have relationships with biopharmaceutical companies. We haven't actually provided the data to them, but we have worked with them and, you know, done analysis for them or with them so, so that they know um, what sort of data we have. And for instance, Jenny's quality of life measure, which she developed, is shared with other with companies. So we do... We do develop relationships, but we don't usually wholesale provide our data. We would rather manage it and work with them. If they had a question, we could answer it using our, you know, using our data. That would probably be the initial way we would go. We would obviously have to have contracts with them, but that would be prefer would be our preference in the first instance. Jenny might have more to say as well. I can add a little bit more that this has our involvement with supporting um, companies in their thinking on how they're planning their trials or, or designing their trials has, has ranged from being able to provide group data to describe particular characteristics. As, as Daniel said, we haven't provided individual data, but we can provide group data so you can understand descriptive information, um, some specific relationships that, that map to the needs in planning and designing clinical trials. And also we have spent considerable time reviewing with individuals planning trials, aspects of particular questionnaires that might be of value to that trial. And as we know, the treatments are absolutely critical going forward, but it's really important to measure them well, or your answer is less, less well um, less well valid as well because the, the measurement. So we've, we've provided lots of um, support in lots of ways with companies. And so that has been with other databases. And I would imagine that the same sort of benefits can be derived from this very, what is becoming a very large repository of information that is comprehensive and um, I believe very important to the future. Great. Thank you so much. So we should wrap it up. We've gone a little extra, but since everyone stayed on the stayed on the webinar, I, I imagine there was a lot of interest in the questions. So Daniel, you did a fantastic job today. It was really interesting. Thank you so much, Monica. Yeah, yeah really appreciate it. Families really appreciated it. We'll we'll load the recording onto our YouTube channel so that people that missed it can see it, or if people want to listen to it again, they'll have that opportunity. Helen and Jenny, it was great to see you and thank you for joining us today. And um, we'll bring you other webinars. And, you know, Daniel, welcome to do this again six months from now, a year from now, as you get more families and the data becomes, you know, even more comprehensive. Thank you so much. We're looking forward to it. All right. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. bye. bye.